You're still awake, aren't you? Yeah, I heard all the thunder and uh, I know you usually have trouble sleeping when that happens You used to be so scared of the thunder when you were little Oh yeah I had to put stuffed animals around your bed to make you feel like they were protecting you I can do that now No? Okay Um, but I figured I would just come in and check on you and see what's up I can't really sleep either, so Yeah, I, um I actually saw this downstairs in the kitchen Are you reading this? I love this book Stargirl This looks like a new copy You bought this, didn't you? I have one in my room You weirdo Well, now you have your own to ruin, I suppose Start it yet? No. Well, I actually haven't run it in a while. Do you want me to read it out loud to you? I don't mind. I kind of like miss that a little bit. Oh man. I like almost forgot about this entire story It's not too long If I could just do a couple chapters until The thunder outside sort of calms down Yeah, the power is still on um, That's fine but the internet's not working, so <laughs> I can't exactly go watch TV or anything It'll be fun I don't really need an excuse to read you a book Okay You can just sit back Okay And uh, Let me read just a little bit I think One, two... Yeah, oh my god I totally forget all of their names, but like I get that nostalgia of I totally know this book and I know what's going on But I also forget The first chapter is called Porcupine Necktie when I was little, my Uncle Pete had a necktie with a porcupine painted on it I thought that necktie was just about the neatest thing in the world Uncle Pete would stand patiently before me while I ran my fingers over the silky surface half expecting to be stuck by one of the quills Once, he let me wear it I kept looking for one of my own, but I could never find one I was 12 when we moved from Pennsylvania to Arizona When Uncle Pete came to say goodbye, he was wearing the tie I thought he did so to give me one last look at it and I was grateful But then, with a dramatic flourish, he whipped off the tie and draped it around my neck It's yours, he said, going away present I love that porcupine tie so much that I decided to start a collection Two years after we settled into Arizona, the number of ties in my collection was still one <laughs> Where do you find a porcupine necktie in Mika, Arizona, or anywhere else for that matter? Is it Micah? I don't know That's the problem with always reading You don't say words out loud You don't know if you sound like an idiot on my 14th birthday, I read about myself in the local newspaper 
the family section ran a regular feature about kids on their birthdays, and my mother had called in some info. The last sentence read, As a hobby, Leo Borlock collects porcupine neckties. Several days later, coming home from school, I found a plastic bag on our front step. Inside was a gift-wrapped package tied with yellow ribbon. The tag said, Happy birthday. I opened the package. It was a porcupine necktie. Two porcupines were tossing darts with their quills, while a third was picking its teeth. I inspected the box, the tag, the paper. Nowhere could I find the giver's name. I asked my parents. I asked my friends. I called my Uncle Pete. Everyone denied knowing anything about it. At the time, I simply considered the episode a mystery. It did not occur to me that I was being watched. We were all being watched. I feel like nowadays you just look for one on Amazon or eBay or something. Did you see her? That was the first thing Kevin said to me on the first day of school, 11th grade. We were waiting for the bell to ring. See who, I said. Ha! He craned his neck, scanning the mob. He had witnessed something remarkable. It showed on his face. He grinned, still scanning. You'll know. There were hundreds of us, milling about, calling names, pointing to summer tanned faces we hadn't seen since June. Our interest in each other was never keener than during the 15 minutes before the first bell of the first day. I love the first day of school. I kind of just liked going shopping. What I'm thinking of is that one time we got to get all new notebooks. <laughs> because you dumped an entire pitcher of water onto our stash. Yeah. Well, that was a really good thing, even though mom got really mad at you. Um, we got to get the good ones, like the cool ones. I was so sick of like those, the plain solid color ones, but you know, since we had to get new ones, I got to uh, get my cool design. It was very cool that year, okay? Cool was the, the goal. I punched his arm. Who? The bell rang. We poured inside. I heard it again in homeroom, a whispered voice behind me as we said the Pledge of Allegiance. You see her? I heard it in the hallways. I heard it in English and geometry. Did you see her? Who could it be? A new student? A spectacular blonde from California? <laughs> it sounds like a wine like a coffee. Or from back east, where many of us came from. Or one of those summer makeovers. Someone who leaves in June looking like a little girl and returns in September as a full-bodied woman. A ten-week miracle. And then, in earth sciences, I heard a name. Stargirl. I turned to the senior slouching behind me. Stargirl? I said, what kind of name is that? That's it, Stargirl Caraway. She said it in homeroom. Stargirl. Yeah. And then I saw her at lunch. She wore an off-white dress so long it covered her shoes. It had ruffles around the neck and cuffs and looked like it could have been her great-grandmother's wedding gown. Her hair was the color of sand. It fell to her shoulders. Something was strapped across her back, but it wasn't a book bag. At first, I thought it was a miniature guitar. I later found out it was a ukulele. Kid doesn't know what a ukulele is. She did not carry a lunch tray. She did carry a large canvas bag with a life-size sunflower painted on it. The lunchroom was dead silent as she walked by. She stopped at an empty table, laid down her bag, slung the instrument strap over her chair, and sat down. She pulled a sandwich from the bag and started to eat. Whoa. 
half the lunchroom kept staring, half started buzzing. Kevin was grinning. What'd I tell you? I nodded. She's in 10th grade, he said. I hear she's been homeschooled until now. Maybe that explains it, I said. Her back was to us, so I couldn't see her face. No one sat with her, but at the tables next to her, as kids were cramming two to a seat. She didn't seem to notice. She seemed marooned in a sea of staring, buzzing faces. Kevin was grinning again. You think what I'm thinking, he said. I grinned back. I nodded. Hot seat. Hot seat was our in-school TV show. We had started it the year before. I was the producer-director. Kevin was on-camera host. Each month, he interviewed a student. So far, most of them had been honor student types, athletes, model citizens, noteworthy in the usual ways, but not especially interesting. Suddenly, Kevin's eyes boggled. The girl was picking up her ukulele, and now she was strumming it. And now she was singing. Strumming away, bobbing her head and shoulders, singing. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. Stone silence all around. Then came the sound of a single person clapping. I looked. It was the lunch line cashier. And now the girl was standing, singing her bag over one shoulder and marching among the tables. Strumming, and singing, and strutting, and twirling. Heads swung, eyes followed her, mouths hung open. Disbelief. When she came by her table, I got my first good look at her face. She wasn't gorgeous, wasn't ugly. A sprinkle of freckles crossed the bridge of her nose. Mostly she looked like a hundred other girls in school. Except for two things. She wore no makeup, and her eyes were the biggest I had ever seen, like deer's eyes caught in headlights. She twirled as she went past, her flaring skirt brushing my pant leg, and then she marched out of the lunchroom. From among the tables came three slow claps. Someone whistled. Someone yelped. Kevin and I gawked at each other. Kevin held up his hands and framed a marquee in the air. Hot seat. Coming attraction, star girl. I slapped the table. Yes. We slammed hands. They're cute. Sometimes when you read it out loud, you get the full, uh, the full effect. Here, wait one second. I heard something outside. I didn't want to scare you or anything. When we got to school the next day, Hillary Kimball was holding court at the door. She's not real, Hillary, with an eye, said. She was sneering. She's an actress. It's a scam. Someone called out, who's scamming us? The administration. The principal. Who else? Who cares? Hillary wagged her head at the absurdity of the question. A hand flashed in the air. Why? School spirit? She spat back. They think this place was too dead last year. They think that if they plant some nutcase in with the students, like they plant narcs in the school, someone else shouted. Hillary glared at the speaker, then continued. Some nutcase who stirs things up, then maybe all the little students will go to a game once in a while or join a club. Instead of making out in the library, chimed another voice, and everybody laughed and the bell rang and we went in. Hillary Kimball's theory spread throughout the school and was widely accepted. You think Hillary's right? Kevin asked me. Stargirl's a plant? I snickered. Listen to yourself. He spread his arms. What? 
This is Micah Area High School. Did we decide it was Micah or Mika? Arizona. <laughs> it's not a CIA operation. Maybe not, he said, but I hope Hillary's right. Why would you hope that? If she's not a real student, we can't have her on hot seat. Why not? <laughs> Kevin wagged his head and grinned. As usual, Mr. Director, you fail to see the whole picture. We could use the show to expose her. Expose. <laughs> can't you see it? He did the marquee thing with his hands. Hot seat uncovers faculty host. Hoax. <laughs> I stared at him. You want her to be a fake, don't you? He grinned ear to ear. Absolutely. Our ratings will go sky high. Aren't their ratings just like this cool? <laughs> you have a maximum rating. <laughs> I had to admit, the more I saw of her, the easier it was to believe she was a plant. A joke. Anything but real. On that second day, she wore bright red baggy shorts with a bib and shoulder, sp shoulder straps. Overall shorts. Her sandy hair was pulled back into twin plated pigtails, each tied with a bright red ribbon. A rouge smudge appled each cheek and she had even dabbed some oversized freckles on her face. She looked like Heidi, or Bo Peep. This girl was about, like, before her time. This sounds like... This sounds like something that is, like, cool nowadays. Like the fake freckles and the overall shorts and pigtail braids. I don't know. <laughs> she had something going. At lunch, she was alone again at her table. As before, when she finished eating, she took up her ukulele, but this time she didn't play. She got up and started walking among the tables. She stared at us. She stared at one face, and then another, and another. A kind of bold, I'm looking at you, stare you almost never get from people, especially strangers. She appeared to be looking for someone, and the whole lunchroom had become very uncomfortable. As she approached our table, I thought, what if she's looking for me? The thought terrified me, so I turned from her. I looked at Kevin. I watched him grin goofily up at her. He wiggled his fingers at her and whispered, Hi, star girl. I didn't hear an answer. I was intensely aware of her passing behind my chair. She stopped two tables away. She was smiling at a pudding-bodied senior, roasted, named Alan Furco. The lunchroom was dead silent. She started strumming the uke and singing. It was happy birthday. When she came to his name, she didn't just sing his first name, but his full name. Happy birthday, dear Alan Furk. Alan Furko's face turned red as Bo Peep's pigtail ribbons. There was a flurry of whistles and hoots, more for Alan Furko's sake, I think, than hers. As Stargirl marched out, I could see Hillary Kimball across the lunchroom, rising from her seat, pointing, saying something I could not hear. I'll tell you one thing, Kevin said as we joined the mob in the hallways. She better be fake. I asked him what he meant. I mean, if she's real, she's in big trouble. How long do you think somebody who's really like that is going to last around here? Good question. MAHS, their high school, was not exactly a hotbed of nonconformity. There were individual variants here and there, of course, but within pretty narrow limits, we all wore the same clothes, talked the same way, ate the same food, listened to the same music. Even our dorks and nerds had an MAHS stamp on them. If we happened to somehow distinguish ourselves, we quickly snapped back into place like rubber bands. I feel like that's so, like, 
astute of him to know and say, like, so blatantly. I feel like that's obvious without the protagonist saying it, you know. I don't know. Kevin was right. It was unthinkable that Stargirl could survive, or at least survive unchanged among us. But it was also clear that Hilary Kimball was at least half right. This person calling herself Stargirl may or may not have been a faculty plant for school spirit. But whatever she was, she was not real. She couldn't be. Several times in those early weeks of September, she showed up in something outrageous. A 1920s flapper dress, an Indian buckskin, a kimono. One day, she wore a denim miniskirt with green stockings, and crawling up one leg was a parade of enamel, ladybug, and butterfly pins. Normal for her were long, floor-brushing pioneer dresses and skirts. Every day in the lunchroom, she serenaded someone new with happy birthday. I was glad my birthday was in the summer. In the hallways, she said hello to perfect strangers. The seniors couldn't believe it. They had never seen a 10th grader so bold. In class, she was always flapping her hand in the air, asking questions, um, though the question often had nothing to do with the subject. One day, she asked a question about trolls in U.S. history class. She made up a song about isosceles triangles. She sang it to her plain geometry class. It was called Three sides have I, but only two are equal. She joined the cross-country team. Our home meets were held on the country club golf course. Red flags showed the runners the way to go. In her first meet, out in the middle of the course, she turned left when everyone turned right. They waited for her at the finish line. She never showed up. She was dismissed from the team. One day, a girl screamed in the hallway. She had seen a tiny brown face pop up from Stargirl's sunflower canvas bag. It was her pet rat. It rode to school in the bag every day. One morning, we had a rare rainfall. It came during her gym class. The teacher told everyone to come in. On the way to the next class, they looked out the windows. Stargirl was still outside in the rain, dancing. We wanted to define her, to wrap her up as we did each other, but we could not seem to get past weird and strange and goofy. Her ways knocked us off balance. A single word seemed to hover in the cloudless sky over the school. Huh? Everything she did seemed to echo Hillary Kimball. She's not real. She's not real. And each night in bed, I thought of her as the moon came through my window. I could have lowered my shade to make it darker and easier to sleep, but I never did. In that moonlit hour, I acquired a sense of the otherness of things. I liked the feeling the moonlight gave me, as if it wasn't the opposite of day, but its underside, its private side. When the fabulous purred of my snow white sheet like some dark cat coming from the desert. It was during one of those night moon times that it came to me that Hillary Kimball was wrong. Starcrow was real. This kid all of a sudden became very uh literate. Very Shakespeare. school. Kid talks like that. I don't know. Leo, apparently. Well, want to do one more chapter? Okay. I think the thunder's pretty much gone anyway. But it's good, isn't it? It's really good. 
should definitely finish it tomorrow, though. You should definitely get some sleep, of course. Okay, let me do this chapter. Okay. Chapter 3. We fought daily, Kevin and I. My main job as producer was to recruit people for a hot seat. After I signed someone up, Kevin began researching the person, getting his questions ready. Every day he asked me, did you sign her up? Every day, I answered no. He got frustrated. What do you mean, no? Don't you want her to sign up? I told him I wasn't sure. His eyes bugged out. Not sure? How can you not be sure? We high-fived in the lunchroom weeks ago. We were thinking Stargirl miniseries, even. This is a hot seat from heaven. I shrugged. That was then. Now I'm not sure. He looked at me like I had three ears. What's there to be not sure about? I shrugged. Well then, he said, I'll sign her up. He walked away. You'll have to find another director then, I said. He stopped. I could almost see the steam rising from his shoulders. He turned, pointed. Leo, you can be a real jerk sometimes. He walked off. It was uncomfortable. Kevin Quinlan and I usually agreed on everything. We had been best friends since arriving in Arizona the same week four years before. We both thought the prickly pear cactus looked like ping pong paddles with whiskers, and that saguaros looked like dinosaur mittens. I don't know what that is, do you? <laughs> we both loved strawberry banana smoothies. We both wanted to go into television. Kevin often said he wanted to be a sleazy talk show host, and he wasn't kidding. I wanted to be a sports announcer, or news anchor. We conceived Hot Seat together and convinced the faculty to let us do it. It was an instant hit. It quickly became the most popular thing in school. So why was I balking? I didn't know. I had some vague feelings, but the only one I could identify was a warning. Leave her alone. In time, Hillary's hypothesis, so-called by Kevin, about Stargirl's origins gave way to other theories. She was trying to get herself discovered for the movies. She was sniffing fumes. She was homeschooling gone amok. She was an alien. The rat she brought to school was only the tip of the iceberg. She had hundreds of them at home, some as big as cats. She lived in a ghost town in the desert. She lived in a bus. Her parents were circus acrobats. Her parents were witches. Her parents were brain-dead vegetables in a hospital in Yuma. We watched her sit down in class and pull from her canvas bag a blue and yellow ruffled curtain that she draped over three sides of her desk. We saw her set out a three-inch clear glass vase and drop in it a white and yellow daisy. She did and undid this in every class she attended six times a day. Only on Monday mornings was the daisy fresh. By last period, the petals were drooping. By Wednesday, the petals began to fall, the stem to sag. By Friday, the flower hung down over the rim of the waterless vase, its dead stump of a head shedding yellow dust in the pencil groove. We joined her as she sang happy birthday to us in the lunchroom. We heard her greet us in the hallways and classrooms, and we wondered how she knew our names and our birthdays. Her cotton headlights eyes gave her a look of perpetual astonishment, so that we found ourselves turning and looking back over our shoulders, wondering what we were missing. She laughed when there was no joke. She danced when there was no music. She had no friends, yet she was the friendliest person in school. In her answers in class, she often spoke of seahorses and stars, but she didn't know what a football was. She said there was no television in her house. She was elusive. She was today. She was tomorrow. She was the faintest scent of a cactus flower, the flitting shadow 
of an elf owl. We did not know what to make of her. In our minds, we tried to pin her to a cork board like a butterfly, but the pin merely went through and away she flew. Kevin wasn't the only one. Other kids pestered me. Put her on the hot seat. I lied. I said she was only a 10th grader and you had to be at least a junior to be on hot seat. Meanwhile, I kept my distance. I observed her as if she were a bird in an aviary. One day, I turned a corner and there she was, coming right at me. The long skirt softly rustling, looking straight at me, surrounding me with those eyes. I turned and trotted off the other way. Seating myself in my next class, I felt warm, shaken. I wondered if my foolishness showed. Was I myself becoming goofy? The feeling I had had when I saw her around the corner had been something like panic. Then one day after school, I followed her. I kept at a safe distance. Since she was known not to take a bus, I expected the walk to be short. It wasn't. We trekked all over, past hundreds of grassless stone and cactus front yards, through the tutorized shopping center, skirting the electronics business park around which the city had been invented a mere 15 years before. At one point, she pulled a piece of paper from her bag. She consulted it. She seemed to be reading house numbers as she walked along. Abruptly, she turned up a driveway, went to the front door, and left something in the mailbox. I waited for her to move off. I looked around. No one on the street. I went to the mailbox pulled out a homemade card and opened it. Each tall letter was a different painted color. The card said, Congratulations. It was unsigned. I resumed following her. Cars pulled into driveways. It was dinner time. My parents would be wondering. She took the rat from the bag and put it on her shoulder. Riding there, the rat faced backwards, its tiny triangular face peeping out of her sand-colored hair. I could not see its beady black eyes, but I guessed it was looking at me. I fancied it was telling her what it saw. I fell farther back. Shadows crossed the streets. We passed the car wash and the bike shop. We passed the country club golf course, the biggest spread of green grass until the next golf course in the next town. We passed the welcome sign. We were walking westward. There was us and the highway, and the desert, and the sun blazing above the mountains. I wished I had my sunglasses. After a while, she veered from the highway. I hesitated, then followed. She was walking directly into the setting sun, now a great orange perched atop the mountain crests. For a minute, the mountains were the same dusky lavender as her sand-skimming skirt. With every step, the silence grew, as did my sense that she knew, had known all along, that she was being followed. Or more, that she was leading me. She never looked back. She strummed her ukulele. She sang. I could no longer see the rat. I imagined it was dozing in the curtain of her hair. I imagined it was singing along. The sun lay down behind the mountains. Where was she going? In the gathering dusk, the saguaros flung shadows of giants across the pebbled earth. The air was cool on my face. The desert smelled of apples. I heard something. A coyote? I thought of rattlesnakes and scorpions. I stopped. I watched her walk on. I stifled an impulse to call after her, to warn her of what? I turned and walked, then ran back to the highway. Kind of reminds me of Nick from um, from Great Gatsby. 